Good afternoon and welcome to IVMF's uh, WebNet webinars. My name is Elvis Avdich and I'm uh, part of uh, IVM, IVMF Alumni Services here at IVMF along with uh, our alumni manager Ashley Cavender and today our WebNet session will be on Veterans um, Program for Politics and Civic Engagement and today with us we have Nick and Steve who will tell us a little more about what VPPC is and how to apply for it. And when is the next session? They'll talk about the program. And we also have two alumni from the VPPC program who will talk about their experience in a VPPC program and their decision to join the politics and a little bit about themselves. So that being said, um, just so guys to let you know, this is being recorded. And if you have registered, you will receive a follow-up email with a short survey. Please fill it out. And there will be a recorded link and we'll probably include this presentation as well. So if you have any questions, please make sure you type them in the chat box or raise your hand and we will get to you. That being said, uh, Nick and Steve, welcome. Hey, thanks, Elvis. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thanks for uh, joining us on this uh, for this information session on our Veterans Program for Politics and Civic Engagement. Uh, my name is Nick Armstrong. Uh, I lead the research and analytics team at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse University. Um, we've got a, a short briefing here just to give you some background on, on, the, uh, on the program itself, as well as just uh, the university's efforts and our commitment to veterans. Um, but I had also just mentioned, um, you know, I, this program is, is really unique in the sense that um, while the IVMF, our institute, uh, delivers a number of programs across the country, um, this, is the, this is one in particular that, that we uh, operate uh, in close partnership with our, our colleagues at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs uh, based here at Syracuse University. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that. And uh, uh, you can hear from uh, my partner in crime and colleague, Steve Lux. Uh, I don't know, Steve, if you wanna say a few words just to introduce yourself to the group before we dive in. Sure, uh, Nick. Uh, first of all, pleasure to see everyone here. And I think the main objective, as I kind of wrote in the, in the chat is, uh, we're gonna try to be as brief as we can and then answer any questions you have about the program. I'm, I'm the director of executive education here at the Maxwell School. And um, it's just a thrill to be able to, to work with Nick and the team at IVMF on this particular training, training work. Thanks, Steve. So just a just a very brief agenda for a few minutes. We're just going to talk a bit about, I'm going to share a little bit about Institute for Veterans and Military Families and uh, the broader Syracuse University efforts of late. Um, and then Steve's going to talk a, a bit about the Maxwell School in their background. And then we're going to talk a bit about the program, how it's designed, delivered. Um, and hear from uh, two of our distinguished alums, Lou Luba, who's on right now, and then Eric Ryan, who's another uh, a recent alum who's going to join us at the bottom of the hour. Um, then we can have an informal dialogue and Q&A just to, just to hear a bit more about the programs. But uh, we're, we're really excited the program's in its fourth year. Um, we're entering our fourth year of it um, and just excited about all the interest that it's, uh, that it's gained over the, over the last several years and even the success of several of our alums who are already uh, in office, running for office, et cetera. So uh, with that, I'll just give a bit of a brief, brief background. Um, I think we're gonna share these slides with you, but we do have links to, uh, if you would wanna dive in and get a little bit more background on our Institute and the IVMF that are linked in the PowerPoint. Um, but just to, just to give you a high level sense of Syracuse University. So I actually transitioned out of the army in 2007, came here initially for grad school. I did not have even a full appreciation for how, uh, how long and how deep the history of the university's roots in terms of its connection to the military go. Actually, this picture here uh, is from World War I. Um, and this is the Service Army Training Corps. Actually, Syracuse University has the longest, continu longest continuously running Army ROTC program in America. Um, and this is a picture of that group. Um, we were one of the first original Service Army Training Corps that were stood up that did not close their doors um, in, uh, in the wake of the uh, Vietnam War. Um, and so they continue today. Uh, but really that history, um, you know, really, uh, um, uh, post-World War II, 
our chancellor at that time was part of the presidential commission that created the Service Members Readjustment Act or the, or the GI Bill. And at that point in time, Syracuse University was a small liberal arts teaching college for the most part in uh, upstate New York. Uh, he had an enrollment around 3,500 students. Um, and uh, our chancellor at the time, who was actually a cadet in that picture I just showed you, um, he was, uh, he was instrumental in terms of not only being on that commission, but really seeing that as an opportunity to transform the, uh, Syracuse into uh, a major R1 research university, literally opening its doors. So he actually had sent a memo in traditional military format to returning war veterans regarding your future. And we have that actually framed out uh, in, our, in our outer uh, outer offices here. Uh, but it essentially opened the door to any returning service member, even if they didn't complete had complete their high school diploma, uh, to come to Syracuse to, to get their uh, to get their degree. Um, and we we literally saw enrollment triple within 18 months, and that sparked a, a whole bunch of uh, construction projects on campus and literally transformed physically uh, the, the university into into what it is today. And you see here a, a number of other programs across our campus. Um, that, are, that, that sit in different schools and colleges um, that, you know, you know the, the Defense Language School, the, the Defense Controller Program, which is a Maxwell Whitman partnership. So we train all the Army's financial managers have been doing that for 60 years now. Our new house school are, are of, uh, of uh, communications that are the military photojournalism and motion media programs, so all the top guns that follow the SECDEF around. Uh, and take pictures and videos um, come here for, for their training. And of course, the National Security Studies program that Steve and his team oversee at Maxwell is, is another program. And uh, so the Institute, the IBMF, um, you know, really came out of the 9-11 the era um, in, the, in the sense that, um, you know, our boss and vice chancellor, Mike Haney, uh, who's Air Force uh, officer, uh, an entrepreneurship professor here at, at, at Syracuse, uh, came in the mid 2000s and you know, started a, a, a boot camp for service members and small business ownership in 2006. Uh, and what was meant to be his, his hobby to stay connected to the military uh, population, it was really the, 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 our founding story as an institute. And so that one program led to the opportunity to create a, a, a family of programs in small business ownership and career training, and soon enough, the opportunity to create an institute. Um, you know, 10 years post 9-11 in 2011, looking across higher education, you really don't see a whole lot of research centers um, and institutes focused on the military and military or the veteran and military family uh, community. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that was really the, the genesis of our institute of doing something unique and, and taking advantage of all the, all the talent and human capital that sits on a major uh, R1 research university uh, to create innovative programs. Um, and you can see here the two different quotes from our, our World War II chancellor to our current chancellor, chancellor of, of doubling down on this commitment to make Syracuse University the top place uh, in higher education for uh, veterans and their families. Um, so a little bit about the, the IBMF. Uh, today, you know, we operate more than a dozen programs uh, since our inception have, have served more than 170,000 who've gone through those programs. Uh, we've got about 100 or so employees, uh, uh, several dozen students. Um, and of course we do research of like what you would normally think of what, would, what, a, what a university center does. And that's what my team does, but our, we are, uh, the, the program service delivery mission that we have is what truly makes us unique. Uh, about a third of our workforce is actually operating all over the country, delivering these programs in and around DOD and military installations in, uh, in, in veteran communities. Uh, and even some of this training uh, we, we offer abroad uh, where we have uh, large DOD and military uh, presence. So. Um, so that's uh, that's the institute in a nutshell, and I will just say, you know, this this program in particular um, has been something that we've uh, been um, you know collaborating on with Maxwell for for many years. You know, this is something that we've wanted to do uh, for some time now. But I would say probably five six years ago, just seeing a lot of upswell of uh, an interest among veterans of running for office, um, you know, and 
given the given the reach that we have with the veteran community and given the the prestige and reputation uh, of the Maxwell School in particular and, and what they can bring uh, makes us truly a unique collaboration in terms of a, a training opportunity for those who are looking to serve again, uh, particularly in their communities as elected officials. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Steve to give you some background, a little bit more on the Maxwell School, and then we'll dive into the program. So Steve, over to you. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, I promise to be super brief. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna brag about the school. So I think the Maxwell School is an incredible place. I think Lou might agree with that. We'll, 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 we'll test his credentials here in a little bit. Um, what makes the Maxwell School great, as far as I'm concerned, is we're not a school of government, we're a school of citizenship. And to some extent, or to a large extent, um, that's why we're on this call today. We're not necessarily on this call because we want you to have a 50 year career in, in government, or maybe you do want to have a 50 year career. But the point is, uh, we think we all have a role uh, to make our um, country a better place, our world a better place, uh, our communities a better place. And though politics these days is quite polarized, quite complex, quite uh, frustrating, um, I think it requires the type of people that show, show up in a room like this. These are people with military backgrounds, committed to serve, think about the world beyond themselves. They think about others. Um, and so that, that's, that's essentially our, our institution. The way, the way we look at this question of citizenship is both from a, um, an academic social science perspective. We have all the social sciences in our, um, in our school but also in an applied way. Um, if you hit the next slide, Nick, if you want mine. Um, we, we were the first school of public administration and um, we're continually ranked in the top one or two of schools of public affairs in the country. So again, I'm, I'm bragging here and I'll stop bragging here in a little bit, but um, the reason I'm bragging is it's not about me, obviously. It's, it's filled with a whole bunch of faculty that are you know, absolutely committed to, to investigating very serious questions uh, about life in America in particular, but also, also life around the world, but this particular program is foc focused on the United States. Um, and it leads us to bringing in someone like uh, Dr. Grant Rear, who for those of you that make it into the program and, and choose to be with us, um, you know, just has a very, very unique um, uh, perspective on politics in America and what it takes, number one, to run, uh, to, to run well, to hold elective office, what are the challenges associated with that? And he's also just an absolutely incredible character when it comes to his um, personal network of politicians. So he, he, he leads this program from the faculty point of view, the Veterans and Politics Program, but he also runs something called the Campbell Institute. And he's, he's interviewed at somewhere along the, uh, somewhere around 500 uh, different uh, politicians throughout the country you know, just get a very hands-on, practical, applied view of what it is, um, you know, to run for office and what it's what it is to be in office, so to speak. So maybe hit the next slide, Nick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna run through the objectives here quite quickly. Um, so the objective here is a little bit strange, I might argue. Um, our objective is about transition. That is how Edward or Nigel or Claudia. Um, can make a good informed decision about whether or not politics is good for you. And then we're going to make the argument if politics is not good for you, as in running for office or being in the political office is not for you, then are there ways to be civically engaged that are also super helpful and I might argue really part of the American experience. In other words, you don't, we don't have to leave everything up to government. Um, government can do lots of good things. We could also rely on private citizens um, uh, to solve problems out there. Um, so the objective is about transition. And I think what's really important to understand about this, these two objectives, or well, I'll, I'll talk about two, two objectives. The first one is in and around the question of, if you're thinking about running, but not sure, how do you make a good informed decision about whether to run or not? So that, that's one type of objective. The second type of objective is, once you've committed to this idea of running for office, how do you run well? 
or more specifically, how might you win? Um, and in, in, in both senses, we're, we're very applied, we're very practical. We try to say, what, what's it like to run for office if you think about that first objective? What's the impact on your family? What are the things that will be fulfilling? Why, why will this make you feel 10 years from now that you made a good decision? Um, when it comes to you know, the running a campaign, um, there are a whole thing, a series of things that one really needs to consider. And I think one of the things that Nick and I and some of our colleagues here at the Maxwell School realized after we got into this program is there isn't a very simple playbook to run for office. There are some concepts and ideas, but the real crux of the matter is if Chris Mercado is interested in running for office X in state Y in county Z, um, it might be different than what Luba, Lou Luba does to run for office in Connecticut, where he's from. But we, we, what we want to do in this context is kind of raise the questions. How do you get on a ballot? How do you raise money? How do you deal with attack ads? How do you present yourself to the world? Um, these, are, these are really the critical uh, topical areas that we talk about. And Nick, jump in if I'm missing something. Um, and maybe Lou can also jump in later, talk about you know, what were the topics that were most important, you know, particularly to, to him. Um, but at the end of the day, particularly for that second objective, what we hope you walk away with um, is a couple of pieces of paper, maybe electronic form or paper form, that is your game plan, your action plan, your campaign plan. I want to run for this, and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, so that's that's really the the key deliverable. Um, when I think of you know about the speakers, I'll just say two things. First of all, yes, there will be academics in the room, and they're they're lovely people. They're smart people. They'll help you all to conceptualize things. At the same time, we bring in people that have bloody their nose, dirty their shirt. They've been in the arena. This is, some, this is not an abstract concept for them. This is something that they've done for a big part of their life in one way or another. And you know, one of the questions we often ask them is, you know, where did you fail? <laughs> what went wrong? What, what types of mistakes would, would, you, would you suggest to our students um, to avoid? And related to the speakers, both academics, but also you know, and, and practitioners, if you like, um, we're heavily uh, uh, interested in including veterans who run for office. And um, we have a, um, a Pamela Hunter, she was, uh, I can't remember what service, I think maybe the army, um, that um, she had a military career, she, she transitioned out and now she's a New York State Assemblywoman. Actually, you know, one of the very few underrepresented minorities in the state assembly, women and underrepresented minorities. Um, and, you know, essentially you say, well, what was different about your experience being a veteran and running for office? And, you know, what are some of the things you can help you all in this room to think about? Um, you know, it, the, one, of the, one of the critical things is um, the political system is not a hierarchical structure. You don't take orders from the top and just, you know, it's much more chaotic. So some of the things we learn about hierarchy and command and structures in, in organizations like the US military, sometimes, those leadership lessons have to be tweaked. You have to, you have to kind of jig them a little bit to um, make them apply to a political, political environment. Um, program structure is pretty straightforward, um, in part because of COVID, but you know, we, we were already kind of moving in this direction anyways. What we, what we do is we typically start with a series of online uh, classes uh, once a week, We've done typically, sometimes we change our mind on this, but the words we like to use, it's a level set people. Kind of share a base level of knowledge about what we mean by running for office, getting in the political arena, maybe learn about this and that. It could be about how you craft a message, whatever it might be. And then we have on-campus programs as too. This, this past year, um, because of COVID, we had people on campus for three days. Um, and so we had intensive, uh, educational component that we that we did, um, but in general, it's it's it, we still imagine that the program structure will continue to be um, uh, heavily dependent on online interaction. Um, in the past year, and I think we'll do it again. We 
after the weekend that people are on campus, then people go away, they write their campaign plans and then they come back. Um, the one thing I wanna, I wanna say, and I'm, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna be very quick, um, that this year's iteration is, we're gonna try to make what we call ideation, which is a very short course that basically asks the question, are you sure you wanna run? We're gonna to try to make that open to as many people as we can and perhaps more intensively online than in person. Um, because in, in essence, we're gonna to try to stretch ourselves to let as many people into that, um, that exercise as we can. And essentially that's 12 hours of work, at least that's, way, that's how we handled last year, um, 12 hours of interaction. Um, so that, that's, that's one course, that's what we call ideation. We expect that to take place in September. Um, and then we expect to open up a course in October and then continue in the, into November, where it's that second question, that a second objective. Um, okay, you know you want to run. How do you do it well? How do you put together a campaign plan? Um, that again will include um, online sessions. It'll also include a piece on campus, um, and then additional online sessions where where people get to present their their campaign plans. Um, so I assume you'll have other questions about program st structure, but I'm gonna stop there because I'm, I'm afraid about running up when I wait for time. So just about expectations, um, just to be clear, um, and this relates to how to apply, what you'll find out very shortly because you're on this list, we'll send you emails, we'll put up on our website. We're gonna open up an application portal and we're gonna try to make that relatively painless. We, we, you know, we wanna vet people and make sure that you're a good fit for the program, but we wanna make it as easy as possible as well. Um, so the application will open April 1. We normally keep it open for about six to eight weeks. Then we try to uh, make some decisions in um, July. And then we, we put that class together in August and then we get to work in September, October, November. Um, so the application process will be going out to all of you via email. Um, and our expectation is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're, we're looking for people to take it seriously. You know. Uh, if, if, if you get into this program, what we call the signature program, it's the one where we actually help you to create a campaign plan. You know, our, our, our main goal is that you show up, uh, that you contribute to the discussions, you learn as best you can, um, and then you get to that place where you deliver a campaign plan. And that's, that's, that's kind of the main expectation. Um, What's interesting this year uh, and, and kind of moving forward is at this point, we have a hundred graduates of the program. Um, so, so really important thing relative, this is also alumni networking. What we, what we hope of you when you graduate from a program like this, that you'll be, be an active member in that network and you'll share stories and share, share, um, share experiences and, and, and lessons learned. So um, trying to think, what, I, what did I miss, Nick? I usually miss something. That was pretty great overview, Steve. Um, yeah. Well, why don't, why don't I get out of the way? Um, and I think Lou and maybe then Eric shortly thereafter will jump in. Um, but Lou, how about Lou? What do you got to say, bud? Oh, good. All right. Um, well, first off, everyone, uh, hi, my name's Lou Luba. I am a uh, VPPC uh, alum from class 2019. I'll see, uh, I have one of my buddies there, Anthony giving you a shout out. Good to see you here uh, that we were in uh, the program together. Uh, first off, I have to congratulate you all for even considering entering the arena in, uh, in something like this. The mere fact that you're here is a substantial step because that means that you're ready to, to seriously look at uh, uh, getting involved in politics in one way or the other, either being a, uh, a, a political uh, candidate or supporting a candidate um, or even just thinking about it uh, down uh, down the line. Uh, for myself, uh, a little bit back about my background, I am a, uh, a Coast Guard uh, retired commander, retired back in 2016 after 20 years uh, between the uh, active duty and reserve, three deployments overseas, uh, twice over in the uh, in the NAG, once over uh, once on in Guantanamo. Uh, was uh, retired as an executive officer of a port security unit. Um, you know, so if there's any coasties out there please hit me up. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, as far as well, what I'm doing right now, that uh, as for politics, I am a uh, uh, council member, a town council member for Tallinn, Connecticut, which is a uh, town just outside, just off the uh, Yukon uh, grounds. 
that uh, we have a population of about 15,000. And when I, uh, when I thought that I, you know, getting into a uh, politics for a small town, I thought, hey, you know, a lot of shaking hands and kissing babies and a lot of fun stuff, cutting ribbons and stuff like that. And I learned the brutal reality that small town politics is probably worse than anything that anyone could ever imagine because you are uh, with your neighbors all the time. And when you're out there grocery, uh, at the grocery store, uh, that there's never a, uh, a quiet moment. Um, that uh, in my civilian job, I'm a uh, prosecutor for the state of Connecticut and been doing that for 27 years. So uh, a, a little bit of uh, state service and politics and a lot of things involved in there. Uh, the one thing I would like to say is as veterans, um, first off, thank you all for your service. It's great that uh, you know, there's not enough out there that are actually looking to get involved in politics and that uh, politics is an incredibly rewarding uh, career uh, endeavor. That is something that has been, uh, although I say that it's difficult, it's been incredibly rewarding because you get to give back to your community um, in, in a very, uh, very specific and, uh, and touching way that you're out there and just like we all raised our hands and took that oath to uh, support and defend, we're just doing it in a different uniform and in a different way. Um, that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of great things about being involved in it. And some of the great things is that, um, especially for the, BP, uh, for the VPPCE program, uh, Anthony and I are probably uh, on the most polar opposite sides of, of, uh, of the spectrum as you can be. Uh, I won't tell you which is which, um, but um, that uh, there's a lot of differences in, in our class. We were the first class and that uh, um, no matter what it was, the one thing as veterans, what we learned to do is we put aside our politics. We would discuss it amongst each other after hours. But when it came down to get, getting the mission done and getting something uh, worked out and working together, veterans have that unique perspective, that unique ability to be able to do that that we put aside our differences, if there are any, and we work together for a common goal and a common mission to achieve that. And what you're doing is you're carrying that through to a, uh, again, to dial politics. Um, that it's um, that ability to work together and the ability to see the bigger picture that really puts veterans in a very unique position in any type of politics, be it local, state, or, uh, or federal, that, um, we have, uh, Anthony, I have several classmates that have actually uh, gone on to, uh, to run for, uh, for federal politics. John Lira uh, running down in Texas, that we had Larry Wallace who was running, uh, was running in Texas, but because of the way things panned out with the redistricting, uh, decided to suspend his campaign. Both of them uh, 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 you know, were, are just incredible people and in that we were, I consider myself very lucky to so call all of them uh, my friends that we, uh, we talk on a regular basis and exchange ideas. And that's the network that you're in. The one thing about this program, um, which I like to say is that if you're accepted in the program and just by being part of this, the, the Maxwell School is incredible. As Steve said before, uh, I actually have a unique perspective where I'm a uh, Maxwell alum that I, uh, not just from the program, but also before where I went to law school as well as the, uh, uh, the uh, MPA program I did a joint uh, uh, JD MPA program through us uh, through Syracuse to this College of Law as well as the Maxwell School. Uh, my son ended up graduating from Syracuse just last year, so uh, Syracuse runs deep in our family. And I uh, that the one thing I will say is that the Maxwell perspective and the Maxwell education and exposure that you get is un unlike any others. It's second to none. Um, that you have you learn from some of the best people, not just scholars, but people that are out there in the field who are actually have the experience and then and can bring a, a, a definitely a unique perspective um, uh, to uh, to everything that uh, with Grant, that before I even uh, started the program that I actually reached out and that the max uh, that the program, the VPPC program helped me out where I was looking at doing my messaging. And one of the greatest things that you'll learn as uh, from this program is the ability to message. And the one thing that they uh, that we got trained in is that elevator pitch, where you you're in an elevator with somebody, you got two minutes to make your pitch and sell somebody, and that's something where I you know have really brought to you know brought to my, to my perspective, uh, to my toolkit, 
and it's it's maybe a uh, better speaker, a better presenter, and it really gives you, makes you boil down the essence of who you are and why you're running to that two minute pitch. Um, because if you can't sell somebody in two minutes, you're not going to sell anybody anything. So um, yeah, at least got to hook them in. And that's really what the, this program is incredible in doing. It gives you a, a wide variety of tools in your toolkit to draw upon and to know how to do things and, um, and how to improve yourself, not just as if you're running as a candidate, but as a, uh, as a uh, supporter, as a manager. I mean, one of my uh, things that before I became uh, involved in, the, uh, in this program is I also ran two ca uh, congressional candidates. I was a, 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 um, a uh, uh, manager for one of the uh, one of the congressional candidates out of here in Connecticut and assisted another candidate um, in uh, uh, in Massachusetts, both of them veterans. And again, that's just drawing upon that uh, that uh, that fellowship, that that camaraderie that really made it something uh, something great. But rather than uh, boring you all, I'm sure that uh, we'd rather go on and, and start discussing things and having questions and handing it off to Anthony or to uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if Eric's on or anybody else is online. Uh, to discuss their experience, but congratulations for taking this first step. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that politics is uh, an incredibly difficult. It's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a rough and tumble career that you're going to engage in, but it's one that is incredibly rewarding. And uh, I just congratulate you all on, on, on looking at it and uh, just know that we're all out there to support you. Uh, you know, services aside, a veteran is a veteran and we all work together. Thanks. Thanks, Lou. Anthony, Eric, any reflections? Hey everyone, it's Anthony Galata here, um, former Army vet. Um, the program is great. It's the best program I've ever been part of. Um, when you guys get there, the politics are really thrown to the side because uh, after classes, you guys will be hanging out, having dinner, having a few drinks. And if you guys were accepted to a program, Steve's office is really interesting. He has a lot of good stuff in there, well-traveled. Um, I highly recommend this program. I kid you not. Thank you for the time. Thanks, Anthony. I think Eric's on. Eric, you want to jump in? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to jump in. And uh, I think like was earlier said, I'm, I'm really happy to take questions for sure. And because and, I think that's the maybe most valuable uh, information that folks could get is their specific questions answered. But just a couple words uh, on why I think it's so important for veterans to jump in and get involved in politics and what I, I took out of this class and what I think you guys could take out of this class. Um, it, so first off, uh, like we said earlier, thanks for being interested and willing to get up and serve again. I think regardless of what level you're looking to serve at, you'll find that your experience as a military person will help you dramatically. One of the things that has been uh, become obvious to me since uh, I left active duty military and I, I'm actually still a reservist myself. But what I've seen in, in the many different capacities now that I've served in, whether it's as a, a federal civilian in a variety of, of US government agencies or in academia or in the private sector, is that what, you, what, what we have in spades in the military and what you see regularly displayed on a daily basis that is leadership is deplete in other organizations. You take for granted the leadership that is in, in your daily life in the military and you see in your peers, you see in the people that work for you, you see in the people that you work for. That, that probably many of you have seen doesn't exist the same way in your civilian life and politics is no different. There are, are plenty of folks, whether they're people that you'll work with or people that you'll run with or people that you'll run against that don't really understand what it means to lead and things like service before self. That um, not only gives you an advantage to be a, a better politician and federal, you know, uh, government service individual, um, it is, uh, it, it's one of the things that will make you not only electable, but good at your job. So take advantage of that, think about that deeply um, and eventually go and live it. What was important to me about this, this job, and I've actually still never been to Syracuse because I did this remotely through, through COVID. So I'm still looking forward to seeing Steve's office in, in person at some point. Um, what, this took, what I took away and what I think you can take away from this, regardless what level of uh, office you were looking to run for, 
is some basic tools and organization. There's not a path in politics like there are in so many career fields. You don't have to stop at assistant, started an assistant dog catcher to run through all of the necessary positions to run for the US Senate or for governor. At any point, you can start anywhere. That's good and bad. One of the things that, that was the greatest piece of advice that I was given in, in my short political career so far was given to me by my former boss, uh, Senator Tim Kaine. And he said, whatever office you choose to run for, make sure you can afford to win or afford to lose. And that's important. Think about how you're running for office and, and the job that you may be willing to take is gonna affect your professional career, how it's gonna affect your family um, and what it means for you if you win or lose and what's next after that. These are really important things to think about and there's not a, there's not a natural path. What this course will do is help organize some of those thoughts for you, help identify what those steps that you, you probably need to take and some of those skills that you need to develop to make you competitive regardless of the level of office that you're going to run at. Um, so there are other programs that are out there. This one does it exceptionally well. I've been lucky to be a part of a couple of them. I was successful in my first attempt at running for public office. I currently uh, serve as a Jamestown council member. I'm coming up on, on a decision whether or not I run for that office again. So I'm going back to the playbook a little bit myself from a couple of years ago to see what I need to brush off in making that decision and then starting my own campaign again. So I'll kind of leave it there and, and I, I wanna definitely save a lot of time for questions. Thanks, Eric, uh, Anthony, Lou, uh, great insights. Um, you know, and I can't emphasize enough the, the points that, that you all made around, you know, how this is really about figuring out like a playbook that will work for you in your, in your particular situation and the value of having a network to bounce that off of in a, in a, in a, in a structure through the, through the training itself. So um, great comments. Um, I see Steve actually dropped in a couple links to a few active campaigns from some of our alums, including John's and David and Dan's. So feel free to check those out, but uh, if there are questions coming in. Elvis, are, are, are you fielding those? Or are we just gonna roll through? How do we wanna do that? Uh, you can just answer them and I'll, I can feed you those as well. I'm just trying to catch up here. So I, I might just jump, I dropped in something about the cost. I, I, hopefully that's clear enough. If not, just ask again, no worries. Um, you know, in terms of the uh, program length, um, maybe two ways to think about this. So I talked about two objectives or two courses, so to speak. The first one is roughly 12 hours of commitment that we spread over typically two or three weeks. Um, and, and it's essentially all online. Um, we, we might actually, uh, build out this year, ability to do it on your own time. And in other words, there'll be some asynchronous components, but for sure there will be a human interaction component to that, that part of the program for sure, because that's kind of our shtick. We don't like to complete, uh, completely robotic here. Um, the, the second program, uh, when I'm talking about the objective being create a campaign plan, and you know, because you kind of know that you're running for office, um, that, that's a little bit longer, I would say more than like the 30 hours of commitment. And it starts with uh, a couple, you know, weekly sessions over, over about four weeks time. Each of those sessions about an hour and a half long or so. Um, and then there's a more intensive week where there are more like four hour days, you know, five days in a row, something like this. And, and last year, I call it, I don't know, COVID plus one or something. It was this, we had, we were still living in COVID, but we allowed for, for some on-campus, um, some interaction. So, um, and then there's always follow-up after that intensive, because that's the point when we ask people to actually go out on their own, spend some time pickling in this knowledge, create a campaign plan, and then, then we come back and present. So, so that, that might answer the question about total time commitment. Um, yeah, so there, there's, I guess the one thing to mention about the signature course, there is, there's, there's a time commitment per week, an hour and a half per week for a period of time. And then there's an intensive period where we're asking three to four hours per day for four or five days in a row. So that's, that's kind of what that's about. Um, 
Did I miss anything on the logistics there, Nick? Or do you want to add something? Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the application? So we're opening the application window in April. Yep. Um, so that will that announcement will go out. Typically runs about six weeks, and then we have a selection process for that. And as Steve mentioned, we run two two tracks now. Uh, the ideation track and the signature track. Uh, and part of what factors into that, you know, in, in terms of your application is in just in terms of readiness uh, to actual campaign. So the ideation, Steve, I don't know if you want to hit that again. We had a couple of folks come in uh, who might have missed the uh, yeah. cover to the top, but, um, you know, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that. So there, there's, I think readiness is, you know, a little subjective, right? So if you have 10 years left of service, right? You know, we'll we'll probably say, why don't you come back to us when you're you're closer to transitioning out? So that's one question about readiness. So you have you transitioned out of the military or not? On occasion, we'll let someone who's still got about six months left because they know for sure they're getting in, or they just want to learn more about it. Um, the other part of readiness is, you know, what what have you done already um, to consider this idea? And um, you know, if you're an extrovert, this is really easy. You just wake up and you start talking to people and you, you know, if you're a little bit more inter introverted and you want to kind of do your homework on your own, it's a little bit more mysterious. Um, but, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll see people said, well, they've already talked to their um, local party uh, uh, infrastructure and that varies from place to place, but um, it could be the party chair in Lou Luba's, you know, county or in his, whatever it might be. Um, so those, those types of things are, you know, there's signals that you're, you know, you've done a little bit of homework already um, to think about this. You know, one of the things we'll say um, in the course of a program like this, but you could also just start doing it right away. You know, if you, if you think you have an idea about an office that you might want to run for, one of the best things to do is call up the person who holds that office and interview them. And say, how'd you get here? How's, what's it like? How's it going? Um, they may or may not be veterans, but, um, you know, if they are veterans, even better, because you can kind of talk about that other nuance, like what's the transition look like for a veteran. But um, um, so that's so readiness. I, I just, you know, be you know, honest. It's a, it's a little subjective. Um, and we're just trying to get a signal that um, you'll be able to take advantage of what we have to offer in the near term. I don't know if that answers it well enough. Nick, please jump in. Uh, that's great, Steve. And if, if anyone, buddy, please feel free to jump in if you want any clarification on any of that. Um, so there's another question around the size of cohort, you yeah. know, qualities of folks. Um, I would say, you know, it's, that's like been a moving target for us each year because we've yeah. been, we've been kind of learning as we go with this program in terms of trying to open it up, you know, make some shifts, tweaks here and there to, to make it more accessible to folks based on current circumstances, clearly COVID. COVID actually created an opportunity for us to expand the offering. And I think that's why we are now running two, these two tracks, ideation and the signature, because we saw that as, uh, as a chance to uh, bring more folks into the, into the fold, you know, just to, to, to test the waters a little bit uh, in terms of whether or not this is right. a path they want to pursue uh, in greater depth. Yep. Uh, and so cohort wise, what, 2025 per group is kind of the sweet spot, but we are experimenting it with, you know, particularly on the, with the ideation, the first phase of that offering of trying to expand that to broader groups. Yeah. I mean, if we, if we were, if we had the capacity, it's almost like we'd love to let everyone into this ideation short course, you know, 12 hours, you know, almost as a form of application, but um, we just have some, some resource constraints to kind of think about that. But, but as Nick said for that, you know, I'm, I'm ready, I'm, I want to run, now I gotta, I'm, I'm ready to build a campaign plan. That, that's where it's a little bit tighter, 20 to 25 to 30 people, because it's, it's kind of intense and it's also intense for our faculty. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question here around uh, the April application. So the applications open in April and those, that application runs uh, for uh, the better the better half of a, of a month or so. And then we, through the summer, go through a selection process and yep. interview and screen folks uh, to be admitted into one of the two uh, tracks, training tracks, uh, I would say by usually the first week of August is yep. generally where we, uh, we try to target. 
So, so Kane asked a great question about any restrictions on an applicant running an active campaign. Um, I don't think that's a restriction. So I, I think that that sounds like you might be, you know, in an elective rate. Oh, there. Do you want to speak up, Kane? Yeah, please. Oh, yeah, good. absolutely. And, and I apologize for all the uh, all the questions and chat. No, no, we love the questions. You're helping us out, man. Oh no, but thank you. But yes, no, I'm I'm currently running um, for uh, a school board trustee. Uh, oh, here cool. in Bozeman, Montana, and so yeah. I just wanted to ensure that you know I'm I'm not uh, breaking any rules or something along those lines by no. uh, applying to this. No, and you know, like sometimes you know what you might talk about, Kane, in, in the application is also, you know, is that your final destination, which is fine, right? Or is it also a stepping stone, like kind of that kind of helps us understand where where you might be. Um, you know, school boards. You know, it's just an interesting thing, right? You know, and it's becoming more polarized, and we need we need sane people in, on school boards, right? Um, but that's, that's the whole reason I'm running. It's, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a very uh, moderate uh, in, in my views, and you know, the one thing that I think that is great that veterans uh, bring is, you know, you talk about diversity. I mean, even just take a look at this at this call. You, know, you have every every color, you know males, females, and we all come from a common background. And, um, you know, so I, I just really hope to, to uh, start here as a stepping stone yeah. and then hopefully, you know, uh, build a network to, to grow that. Because I think that we yeah. need more sanity in politics today. Yeah. To your point. And I'll, I'll just, you know, jump on that comment, Kane. I mean, uh, we're absolutely committed to this notion of diversity in the most broad sense of diversity that you can all imagine. So as Lou mentioned, we, we, we do try to make the cohort um, bipartisan, if you like. You know, we, we want equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats, in part because we, we're not picking a side here. I mean, you, you might assume that universities have a certain bent when it comes to politics, um, but in this room, <laughs> when we're talking together, um, we're not picking sides. We're just here to help people run for office, no matter where they come from or what their objectives are. We, we start with the premise that you're all good people and you've got good ideas and we're gonna help you get there, where we wanna go. Um, the second thing about diversity is, which I don't know about Nick, but um, one of the things I've loved about this program is out of the quarter of 25 to 30 people, we have typically 12 states represented if not more, I, sometimes I lose track of the numbers. Um, in, it, it's interesting, in the years one, we had, frankly, fewer underrepresented minorities and fewer women. I think actually doing it online, more, more online helped us uh, in, increase diversity. So um, and again, we, we have a very uh, objective interest in diversity. Um, it's, in other words, it's not, I mean, I don't take it as, I mean, morally, I think it's an important thing. Ethically, you can talk about diversity in lots of ways. When I think about diversity here, it's diversity of thought and perspectives that we want to bring to a conversation about politics. And um, so I, I, don't, I don't think we, we, we try not to stop at party. We try not to stop at um, a race or gender. We, we try to embrace diversity in the greatest extent we can. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of the ethic. Um, so if diversity is not your interest, this is probably not your, you know, not a great program in some way. Because we're not, we're, not, we're not looking for just one type of person here. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, Kane, or anyone, but. No, it absolutely does. And, yeah. and, and I learned something new. I didn't realize Syracuse had the longest uh, running Army ROTC program. Yeah. Because one of my, uh, it, I, I was actually deployed with her during the start of Operation Iraqi Freedom, Jen oh. Goey, she's the yeah. current professor yeah. of military science there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's cool. Yeah. I mean, you the, the Nick and his team and the vice chancellor, Mike Haney, who was an Air Force officer, if I, is that right, Nick? Yep. Um, I, I just can't tell you how much time and energy they put into creating this a welcoming place for veterans. It's an unbelievable building here and the, the range of programs. If you don't uh, like this program, 
keep looking at IVMF because there's a whole bunch of other stuff you should be looking at that um, that's I'll there. just say that I'll say that Jen has the best gig for a uh, professor of military science in the United States in this building that she's got now. So yeah, well, we, yeah, we, we stay in touch on Facebook. She's always having, uh, you know, fun stuff going on. So yeah. Hey, Eric, you want to jump in? I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to address part of Kane's question too, because I was in a similar boat when when I got selected. I was already in the midst and running for office, so uh, I had my election while we were in class, uh, and that was not problematic. It, it actually worked out great, you know, to to my advantage. Um, and I was also running locally, like like you are, and it still ends up being relevant. Um, like you, this is a place for me that I'm starting, and that's good for me, and works for me now in my career and, and with my family, but it helps me learn a little bit about being in the game. And, it, and it's a good low risk way to test the waters too, to see if you like it and how it's going to work out. So I, I highly recommend people running at the local level like this one, um, because it's a, it's, a, it's low risk to you as an individual. And it's an incredible way to have dramatic return on your investment in time because local races and local offices are usually pretty short on uh, on competent people willing to give a lot of their time. So uh, so good on you for running for, for school board. I think this will help you. One of the nice things too that I found it, at least locally is that the politics matters a lot less at the local level, especially once you get past the, the race. But even in, in the race, um, I think it, you know maybe they're a little bit more polarized than they used to be, but it's not, uh, the, the politics in that respect are not as fierce uh, potentially, but they also are deeply personal. Um, so that's one of the things I think you'll learn and, and learn more about in the course. Hope that helps. Thanks, Eric. Lou, what you got? Oh, no, I was going to I was just going to sort of echo what, uh, what Eric had, uh, and Ted said. I think one thing that he said before is actually something that's pretty accurate, where if you're, uh, if you're looking at running on any level, that it's it's also not just a personal affair, but it's a family affair. Mm. That it's something that you need to really, you know, it's something that's very that that it's it's more time consuming than you would imagine. Um, I think that even on the local uh, on a local thing, I mean, uh, you know, being a, on local politics, that it's uh, something where uh, it's twenty four seven. It's you know, it's with the, when I was a reservist, I used to say it's the best uh, full time job with part time pay you could ever want. Being in local politics, it's the best full-time job with no pay whatsoever for me that you could ever want. Uh, it, it's truly a, a labor of love. So that's something that, you know, uh, that everyone's going to have to consider as well, um, that, uh, that it's a very rewarding thing. I think one of the things that, um, that I saw a question on there that I want to address is that people were like, uh, how has the program, uh, what are some of the things that came up that in the, uh, in the cohorts that that the uh, programs addressed. Being the first one, I think one of the things is that we learned a lot of the theory, but not a lot of the nuts and bolts on, on how to run a, uh, run a campaign. Um, there was some things that we did learn, but I think that uh, having this being now being, as uh, Steve and Nick said, the fourth uh, iteration coming up, I've seen it progress. And I think it's something that's really uh, breaking out of the ideation and now going into the, uh, to the second part of it that it's something that will really give you a much more nuts and bolts type of thing. It's not going to be able to say, this is how you work out your budget, but it'll tell you how to, how to deal with things and how to address certain things. Yeah. So I think that, um, that it's better than just some of the, uh, the theoretical stuff that you can, anyone can read about and hear about and get the talking heads uh, working on. It actually gives you some very practical, realistic yeah. experience. And uh, just to use it as like the, as far as uh, for Kane with uh, running, Actually, um, when I when I uh, started out the cohort, I actually just got elected, and so uh, it was stuff that I had just carried on. And actually, uh, the lessons that I learned helped me get reelected. And I've had so much fun where I've decided that uh, I'd like to pass it on to other people. So this is the last time I'm going to run for re-election um, for for this position um, because there's a lot of younger younger blood out there that want to fill in. But uh, it's something that I'm looking at for possible. Uh, other state positions that are, that are uh, possibly opening up uh, within the next uh, the next few terms. So, but anyway, that those are my comments. So, thanks. And you know, to 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 Lou's point, I think one 
one of the things you're always going to struggle with when you run for politics is, you know, what's the best analytical tool or what are the sets of concepts and generalizable assumptions that you bring into your work plan? Um, we just had some terrific people in every cohort that actually helped us to think about analytics in a different way. I mean, Molly Mae Porter and whoever it is, we had a whole bunch of characters that um, just did incredible analytics. And that's also part of the share and compare, right? We can share with you all um, what people have done in the past um, to come up with a strategy based on some analytics. You know, like for example, one of the first things you should figure out is how many votes did it take to win the election that I covet? It's simple. Was it 5,000? Is it 10,000? Whatever it is. And they'll work backwards, like, well, how many get 10,000 votes or whatever votes you need? And um, so those, some, those things have been really helpful. Connectivity between faculty and practitioners and politicians and students or participants and adults like you um, to come up with those analytical frameworks, if that makes any sense. Question coming here from Brian. It looks like uh, oh, and Lou jumped in. Any position locally? Any thoughts from our electeds on the on the call yeah. about what's most impactful local local office or position? I, I think it's really the one that suits that suits you um, based upon your your availability. You know, one of the things you need to think about for sure is um, a lot of local elected positions. Most locally elected positions are part time. Right, they're not necessarily going to be your full-time job, even if you're at a state-level position. In most places, not going to be your full-time job, even if it is a full-time job. Um, you know, make sure you look and see what the pay and benefits are associated with that job. You may be surprised that it is you're taking a pay cut to do a job that you think is super important. That is very typical. Um, so I'd say that the most impactful job is the one that you can be most impactful in. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, Eric. I think it's something that it's what fits best for you. Um, I started out when I first began uh, that I was asked to run for the Board of Education. I was fully geared for that. And then a month before the elections are like, hey, we think that you're like you, you'd fit this spot. We have a spot coming open on the town council. Would you like to switch to that? And I switched over to that. And, you know, uh, and it's it's something that I feel I'm making a better difference on the town council than I would on the Board of Education. Um, but any position um, that that you take up is is an important position, especially on local politics. Uh, that there's not a single position where a decision that you make isn't impacting somebody directly. And at some point, like there's times I've made some decisions on things where I have to look people in the eye and and, and tell them personally why you know why I voted a certain way. Um, and uh, and that's the diff. I mean, it's a easy thing sometimes and it's a difficult thing sometimes so um it's uh, that local politics is is personal politics uh and that's why uh that's why i'm i'm happy i'm to get involved in it thank you uh nick steve you only have about maybe time enough for one question sure sure any anybody wants to fire away Uh, I'll fill the silence. Brian Olay. Hey, thanks for your time, everybody. I don't know if I want to run and I'm not convinced I need to, to achieve my goals. And it's kind of a weird goal, but I would be a happy camper if I got a hundred of my buddies who are more qualified than I am to go run. Hmm. I, I think that that's right. It's, I'm a means to an end. Is taking this course going to help me answer the question whether I should run or not, or if there's a better way to get more of my buddies to run? Thanks. Yeah. I would say uh, I would say the ideation track is for that very purpose. Yeah, you know, um, so um, it's modeled after some of our entrepreneurship training, um, focused on folks who might want to start a business. Uh, so giving getting you a, just a taste of the the good, bad, and the ugly of what it actually means to run. So I would say I would I would certainly hope so. Steve, I don't know if you have more to add to that. Simple yes. Yeah. Um, Simple yes. And, and of course, you know, we've got folks that are that are working behind the scenes, like um, alums who join, who work on campaign teams and serve in other ways. Um, so that's also an option to think about. 
Well, thank you, everyone. It looks like we are out of time. I just want to say one more time. Thank you, Nick, Steve, Eric, Lou, Anthony, and everyone that participated. Uh, just to remind you, we will be sending out follow-up email with the recorded link and short survey. Please let us know how we did. And we'll also include the presentation and anything else shared in this session. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you on our next webinars. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody.